This is Marketing Jam, a show featuring the brightest minds in marketing. Brought to you by Canada Post. Head to canadapost.ca forward slash insight podcast for ideas to add value to your marketing. As we get going into our show, I want to talk about SEO quickly. This whole search engine optimization thing. People are frustrated by it, confused by it, and probably not really getting the straight goods about how it works. Back when we outsource our SEO, we're often confused when we get the reports back. It seemed like a dark art. They were rubbing some sort of oil on our websites and supposedly magic was happening. When we started using AREFs, it was a game changer. The reports we got, the clarity on site ranking for terms, and really the transparency and understanding between off-site and on-site SEO was really helpful. Today, for all of our clients, we provide HREFs reporting and use the tool to audit sites. It's the premier SEO tool and you can have the confidence you're getting the top quality tool that provides incredible support and resources to help you with your SEO for your brand or the clients you work with. Check out arefs.com Jump right today. In. Thanks everyone for joining us on another week of Marketing Jam. I am so thrilled uh, for our guest today. Uh, I actually am a fan uh, of his podcast, been following him for a while. He's a legend in the marketing world. So without further ado, uh, Tony Chapman, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, so Tony, uh, I know you, you know, the whole show could be about your journey to where you are now, but do you want to kind of give the highlights of kind of uh, your road and, and in the marketing world and what you've seen? And, uh, you know, some of these kind of stories are incredible. I know people can read your bio, but maybe some of the highlights for you um, that got you where you are today. Well, not to worry, but I'm going to take you back to age five, yes, believe perfect. it or not. And I had an incredible mother. One day I decided I wanted to shake the neighbors down by setting up that lemonade stand. Mm -hmm. And uh, she made me uh, learn about how much the lemons cost. I had to rent the pitcher. I couldn't put it in front of my lawn because it's not where the sun was. I had to go to the park. She thought about sampling. At the end of the day, I have no idea if I came back with any more quarters than I would have just doing what I originally intended to do. But I just felt it was my money and I'd earned it. And, and I felt excited about it. And I think that kind of uh, attitude took me into university. I was doing a finance marketing co-major because I love balance sheets. I love numbers. But I started uh, selling radio advertising for a small radio station in the West Island. And it wasn't so much the money I was making, which was incredible because it was a commission only and I got to be quite good at it. It was the, the magic I felt when I put consumers together with sellers like when I you know a little rib shop where I walk in one night and we've it's opening night and people start coming in I ask them where they hear about it, it was a radio station I just really felt early on I found a a higher purpose that if I could continue to put great content out there that would created an itch and it was authentic and it was exciting and in doing it created commerce I couldn't think of a better place to make a living and that's kind of really the notes of entrepreneur lemonade stand content, bringing people together, kind of led me into the world of advertising. Wow. And, and tell me about the, the agencies you've been a part of, because I you know, bought and sold three different agencies and, and you know, you yeah. legend, you know, you're the hall of fame. My first agency was really focused in internal audience. I produced things like sales conferences. And I got to realize how important it was for leaders to animate their vision for cultures to become together. And that's what we did for a living. In fact, I invented a product where I took these slideshows uh, beautiful pieces, you know, Christopher Plummer would narrate it. And the soundtrack would say our product, I bring up that Pepsi logo and our people and Pepsi people. And the next week I could very quickly turn it around into a General Motors show or, a, or in those days, a Nabisco show or a Procter and Gamble. It allowed me recycle my creative platforms. And it was a lot of fun. Did it for about uh, 10 years, sold it to a British firm uh, I, for a, uh, a ton of money. And I can say that because most of that money I never saw because they went bankrupt. They got caught up in uh, the 1992 recession. Mm. Then I decided to go consumer facing because I didn't, I didn't, I wanted to do something different. And, uh, that's when I started capital C and we had an incredible 22 year run, won agency of the year, hundred gold investor show awards, clients like Pepsi for uh, an entire lifetime relationship over two agencies. And about eight years ago, I sold all of that. I uh, just felt I'd done it all. And I went on the road and, and to speak my mind in the media and at conferences uh, in China and Brazil and Spain and all across North America, Scotland, Poland. And that's kind of what I was doing uh, uh, until uh, I got bit by this podcast book. 
That is incredible. So tell me about, you know, Marketing Hall of Fame. Tell me about that, what that was like to be a part of and, and being inducted into that world. I still think I got the Joe Clark vote where just a lot of people were voting for A or B and I happened to be in the middle of it all. And it was a split vote because I have no idea. The people that are in that, I went in the year I went in, uh, Izzy Sharp, uh, uh, you know, the founder of Four Seasons, the founder of, of Shoppers Drug Mark, Bill Dern, who was an absolute legend, mm. Peter Elwood, some big, big names. I think maybe what I did do, though, is capture the imagination of the voters that the time everybody was above the line, it was where all the prestige was, was uh, creating these big TV commercials. And I was kind of in the weeds trying to sell cases in grocery stores. And we were the first into shopper marketing and the consumer and customer journey. And I think that some of the people that were voting that day realized that the future was really very quickly moving to the power the trade has, the retailers had to dictate thumbs up or thumbs down on a brand. And they needed really good creative support. And that's kind of what we did. That's amazing. So, so the time we're living in now, you, you're speaking a lot, you MC a lot. What's it been like kind of seeing events kind of slow down, kind of in-person events and big conferences not happening right now? Yeah, well, first of all, for me, which was the, the advantage is I started looking at the speaking business and going, I'm an aging white guy. Uh, and, you know, the audience deserves that, that incredible new crop of speakers coming up with their diversity, their new thoughts and technology and stuff, things that I couldn't really bring with true, true relevance and value. So I, I reinvented myself as a conference host versus an MC. And the difference being is that I, I'm a journalist on stage. I'm the third party. I get to ask you the questions you want to answer. I get to ask questions the audience wants to answer. But I weave a thread through the entire event so at the end, the, the, we started at the beginning of the conference on a quest. Throughout the day, we measure our progress, but at the end, people go home and say, this is what I've got in my knapsack. So hmm. by doing that, it wasn't so much about age or gender. It really was, do you have the ability to listen generously, curious enough to care about the sector I'm in and ask the questions and bring it all together? So it, the world's changed. Uh, you know, The concept of conferences and events are now happening like we're doing on mm -hmm. Zoom. But I found that my role as a journalist is the ability to keep audiences engaged, to keep, I'm doing a conference next week to 2,000 people, and they've all signed up for it. But now with the distractions of being home and the dog and the kids and the, the snacks and everything else that happens at home, my job is even more exciting because I've got to find a way to be that that uh, narrator, the, yeah. the, the people that, that stitch the thread together to uh, the Yoda at the yeah. conference to really keep it moving. So I, I'm enjoying it. I'm finding the challenge is uh, uh, you got to get excited about the light on your computer versus the energy of 2000 people on the stage. But, you know, reinvention is really the essence of life and, and, mm -hmm. and never fear the fact that things are changing and you got to climb, you got to jump to a new platform. It's the people that stand on the existing platform and watch it burn are the ones that are missing out of the opportunity of a changing world. Wow, I feel like you're also, you play this role of, uh, you've seen Lord of the Rings, the, you know, you play this, you're, you're going down to the mines of Moria and finding the gems and the things in people that maybe they haven't pulled out before. I am absolutely going to steal that because that's a great metaphor and analogy. It's finding those nuggets and polishing yeah. them, but also putting it, I always said, my mantra since day one is head, heart, and hands. Anytime you can make your ideas, your podcast, your marketing job, head, easy to understand, heart, I'm excited about it. Yeah. And hands, I'm taking that away and I'm going, to, I'm going to work with it as you just did. You gave me a gem that I can use because polishing those nuggets, yeah. presenting them in a way that people can relate to them. You know, speakers, a lot of speakers you hire are incredible at their, at their talk. They talk about, you know, trust. They talk about uh, uh, success, excellence. But unless you can find a way to take that and say, oh, how does that impact that audience? What does yeah. trust mean to that person in row three? What does trust mean to the person that just joined the culture, somebody that's 50 that might be worried about losing their job? What does trust mean to them? And if you can make that, if, draw those parallels and draw that bridge, that's a good day's work. So tell me about trends that you're seeing. You, you kind of, you've been in agency world, like, you know, early Mad Men type days, right? Where, you know, it was, uh, you know, big picture and big ideas, but you've always been a pragmatist, it sounds like. And you've always been saying, okay, how does it mix with, you know, numbers and monetization? Uh, what are you seeing with the trends now with kind of shoppers having the power and, and what you said about giving people the control to be able to, you know, decide what happens in a store or not, in a grocery chain? Well, Massive change and, and the people that, that respond to it are going to have an incredible creative journey. The first thing is uh, stop trying to be the hero in your story. And I think a lot of brands in the past want to talk about how fast their network is, how great their, their cola tastes. 
And people don't care about that anymore. None of that matters and the less that matters to me. The consumer's power is about two words. It's more and less. More of what matters to me. That's personal. That's not some Coca Z, Tony the Tiger tastes great. It's what matters to me, my life, my livelihood, the quests I'm on, the things I'm looking for. And I want it with less friction. I want it with less effort. And if you can't give me those two, I want it for a lot less price. Yeah. So the consumer is, is, is demands and, and the people that respond to them, you know, when a, uh, an Apple puts a thousand songs in my pocket or uh, an Airbnb lets me belong in a local community, an Uber lets me summon my chariot, the people that get it are seeing incredible uh, uh, gains in terms of engagement with audiences and actual uh, monetization of that engagement. The ones that don't that still think they matter, they're the, they're, they're the ones that are important, are really losing out. They're becoming commoditized. And more often than not, prices are only tiebreaker. Very, their messaging becomes very transactional, tactile. Second thing I'm seeing is we got a new contract with the, with the humanity, we got a new contract with the planet. Uh, we've got a new contract with just uh, uh, how we live with all other living creatures in this planet. And that's not, uh, that's not marketing buzz anymore. Th those are legitimate asks. And because of transparency nowadays, because of the TikToks and the Snapchats and the social media, I can actually, uh, I can open your kimono and look in. And if I don't like what I see, not only will I boycott you with my wallet, I might hit you with a social media slingshot. Yeah. And in a nanosecond, take all that brand equity that you've got and valued at billions on your balance sheet yeah. and, and erode it and sometimes eradicate it. So that's another, another thing that we're dealing with is, but the last thing I would say to you is that the, the thing that I would be most concerned with and considering to be most opportunistic is the consolidation of power with the, with the you know, grocery retailers, if you're in packaged goods, yeah. with the people that are competing in the platform economy, the Microsofts, the Salesforce.coms, the Googles, the bookings.com, the people that are compressing, consolidating supply chain, rewriting the rules of capitalism, and I always say in my speeches, I mean, who owns the customer now? The, the McDonald's has spent billions, if not trillions of dollars, building out those golden arches, inventing new products in the marketing or Uber Eats. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately it comes down to who has that customer relationship. So lots of change. And uh, if I was in uh, a young person in marketing with all the tools and array I'd have, don't get locked into a, a, a craft like producing TV ads. Don't get locked into a channel like retail. Mm -hmm. uh, really focus on this world of content and traveling like liquid and no dead ends mm -hmm. and finding ways to really impact a person's life and livelihood. Wow. So speaking of uh, impact, Tony, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the fallout of Pepsi's Kendall Jenner commercial. You know, that's, again, a, an organization that it moves, it's trying to move at the speed of life, which yeah. is tough. Big multinationals are used to, I'm going to have a big campaign for Pepsi Cola, and I'm going to yeah. put all my money behind it. Wow, it's got to go around the world now because it's got to be efficient. Okay, let's get a celebrity that everybody knows, okay? Language is an issue because of the nuances. Okay, let's really just do it with, with, with pictures and great music. I mean, that universal, that, that yeah. silent film with sound. I mean, and so they start doing it. Oh, what, what else is going on? Well, really, people are starting to protest. We're all about the choice of the new generation. The new generation is starting to pick up protest cards. So they put it all together. And on paper, it really sounds wonderful. But what they lose with that is, again, the sense of more of what matters to me. And when that came off, it was a very mass-produced ad. Uh, it, 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 in many ways, people felt it was, uh, uh, it really, it didn't do any justice to the social justice of protest. It made it look like that you could defuse, defuse the society's issues by giving uh, someone a, a Pepsi to drink. And it, so it, it completely missed, uh, it was lost in translation. And that's the problem when you're do, trying to do a one size fits all drift net, how can I get everybody caught in, in this ad Versus where I think the future of marketing is fly fishing. What matters to you is very different than matters to me. And that's not just age. It's what I value. It's, it's the things that are happening around me. And if I, I can take my brain and repurpose it and say, I can help you get to where you want to go. That's where the magic is. But that's fly fishing versus drift net. But I think perhaps you just got caught in trying to be that a global net that caught a lot of consumers. Now, tell me about, you got into podcasting. I, I love Chatter That Matters. Tell me about the kind of impetus of that and, and what this show is all about for our listeners. 
You know, first it was just narcissism. I love chasing microphones. I mean, that's the reason I got into doing a lot of media commentary and I love, I love being in conferences, but I really felt that I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to play with the podcast to say, how would I sound? I first ones I did with chat of matters, which is kind of me ranting. Then I said, you know, what I really like doing, and I started to host a lot on radio. I started interviewing people and I really enjoyed that because it wasn't just asking, as you know, the questions It was drawing out those nuggets. And then when they, when the world changed, said, you know, I really started to feel for small businesses, yeah. platform economy, that scale. Uh, I'm feeling for the fact that, that they are the heart. Uh, they not only is that their life tied up in that business, but they're also the heart of the Canadian economy, the North American economy. And it's in our collective interest to take them, to take their interest personally. So I decided to repurpose the, the podcast and really, the, the, the story arc is the hero's journey. I make the, 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 the hero of the story is the small business owner. We yeah. learn about their backstory, their dreams, their challenges, the obstacles they're facing, uh, we, we, and why they're doing this quest. Why do they leave a good job and do this? What's, or do they lose a job after they do We really want to understand that, where they are. Then I bring in three thought leaders and some of the top thinkers. And they do a deep dive into these stories. And they come in with these gems and really offer advice. And at the end of it, uh, the owner gets a sense to appreciate what I had to say to thank them. And I kind of close it all off with, here's what I learned. So it's a tight little 25 or 30 minute uh, biography uh, and, and, and an interception of the quest they're on and, and, and really trying to position these experts as Yodas. I think it's, and I can say this because they're not about me, I think it's must listen for anybody, entrepreneurs, aspiring to be entrepreneurs, but more importantly, as you're gonna see, we're gonna migrate in the next couple of weeks, Anybody that's finding themselves in this gig economy without the benefit of a guaranteed paycheck, a culture, people that they can, that they can rely on, uh, that world, which is a world of uncertainty and insecurity and fear, I, I think anybody in that world is going to get a lot out of the, especially, I think today, but even more so as we migrate away from just small business to the smallest of businesses, which is you. Hmm. And, and tell me about kind of how it started and kind of the support that you're getting right now and, and maybe where you're getting pickup from and you know, I, I, where you're at even advertising it at the moment. Well, so the interesting thing about small business uh, matters originally, which is my podcast is chatter, but chatter that matters, but this, the, uh, the series small business, I originally presented it to uh, a couple of radio stations and CBS, which is uh, it's not the American CBS, but Canadian broadcast broadcast sales. It represents, you know, chorus and stingray and Rogers love the idea and they said we can put this we can put sort of a uh the highlight reel on 60 radio stations and then we approached a bunch of sponsors and i had a pretty good working relationship with rbc they wanted to do something for small business it was a great fit it happened literally from conception of what the small business series would be in my mind talking to the radio station getting rbc involved was two weeks and if anybody's been involved uh, in this world, two weeks it happens in about two seconds. And then we had to get to work and produce one of these every week. And then I started getting more ambitious and I wanted to put posts out on LinkedIn to support. And then I wanted to put tuck in videos. So there's videos of Joe Mimram and Jeannie Becker and, and, and Joe Jacklin and, and uh, uh, Vicky Saunders from CEO and uh, Marae Lavery from uh, CEO of EDC. So we put this all together every week. Uh, it's a labor of love. It will be my Although my wife says it'll never be a swan song until, but it will probably be my swan song that I'll do this for uh, as long as I, as long as I still have this energy enthusiasm, yeah. but I think it'll, it's continually moving away from the need to be even in virtual conferences and much more into this world where I, I can be positive and inspirational versus uh, very often what I'm hearing in the media is this, and, and in some cases in conferences, is sort of this negative energy, this sense yeah. of impossibility. I yeah. want to be on the side of possibility. Hey, are you having trouble tracking inbound phone calls from your website or ads? CallRail gives you the call tracking you need to measure the success of your marketing efforts in real time. Discover how many calls you receive from your Google ads, organic searches, social media efforts, and so much more. But that's not the only reason we use CallRail. CallRail seamlessly integrates your call and conversion data with over 700 marketing tools and platforms, including Google Analytics and Salesforce to fuel deeper insights automatically. Start your free trial today with CallRail. I feel like uh, what John Krasinski did out of his own uh, you know, office, creating some good news, 
uh, gave hope. You know, I, I would watch it every week and almost cry during COVID. It gave me kind of that moment of hope every week. I feel like your show is that hope, that lifeline to small businesses across this country. Well, I, you know, that that's the, mo- the most wonderful thing you can tell me because that's really the quest I'm on. I mean, I've, I've been really lucky. I, I, listen, I don't, I live a, a pretty modest lifestyle and I've made enough money that I, it's going to see me through. So it's not about uh, having to do something or needing to do something, but wanting to do it. And I just want to bring that. I, listen, we're, we're 38 million people in Canada. We have uh, uh, fresh water for the next 300 years and energy for the next three, 300 years. We've got values. Uh, sure, there's a lot of warts, but in, overall, this is an incredible country to live. And I think we could be the epice- epicenter for the new economy. Uh, mm. Instead of just inventing stuff here and having it capitalized in the states or, or, or other countries, I think we, I think our our track record of, of in video gaming with Bombardier used to be Nortel, which is really Huawei, uh, you know, uh, uh, bomb, uh, recreational vehicles, all the things that we've done in the past. I think we can recreate in this new economy. People like. Uh, uh, Sunil Sharma, Tech Stars, and what we're seeing with Entrepreneur First, and and CEO with Vicky Saunders. I mean, we're seeing some incredible energy, and that's what I want people to think about. Don't, don't worry about what's in your rearview mirror. Don't even worry about the fact that it looks like the sky is falling. Just mm-hmm. stare at that sky. You'll see some incredible silver linings. Put your hand up, and people are going to reach for it because that is what this what made Canada great, that immigrant resilience mentality. And I think as long as we can bring it into our schools and bring it into our the people graduating and the people that have capital, this is going to be one of the greatest runs for Canada we've ever seen. And how do you find those Padawans, those, those businesses that are looking for that advice? You know, it's interesting enough, uh, Karuba Sankar is a guy in RBC that's just only in, involved in helping people, uh, companies that with diversity, LGBTQ, uh, yeah. indigenous. So, and he works with these people saying, I'm going to give you a chance to, to compete in the big leagues. And he provided me some names. By the way, they don't put any favoritism other than they show them how to compete. Uh, and, and then, I, you know, uh, I was a fan of CEO, so they supplied a couple of people. Yeah. Uh, now that I'm doing it, people are coming to me with it. And I'm, you know, I'm interested in uh, humility and authenticity. And I'm interested in people that aren't afraid to share their vulnerabilities as opposed to somebody that's looking for a 30 minute commercial, because, you know, if you want a commercial, you can turn on anywhere. If you want to realize there's people just like, uh, just like you that are, that are working, you know, 12, 14 hours a day for the, for their life and livelihood of their family, and they can make it happen. That's, that's the people I'm looking for. It's amazing. So podcasting, you know, almost every day I hear about a new podcast that started and launched and, you know, it's, it's this trend, but for you, you know, what has it been like as far as the logistics of like, where do you host it and how do you kind of follow the data and how do you kind of see growth for a show like yours? It's, it's interesting for me that I'm approaching it like my whole life, you know, when everybody was talking about TV ads, I was in the, in, in the weeds and star, kind of approaching podcasts a little differently, that numbers are important. We've got to host it on Libsyn. It's everywhere. Okay. You get your podcast. It's chatted that matters. We're growing our audience. Uh, you know, I think globally we're 1,000, 1,300 of the million and a half podcasts in the world. So that puts us in the top 1%. But the numbers, are, the numbers aren't what I'm interested in. It's the long tail of the content. So, uh, you know, uh, Chatter That Matters is going to be taught in a Shula class that I'm doing a lecture for next week. I'm, and the 22nd of September, I'm talking to a book club that's really interested in some of these stories of women entrepreneurs. And they want to, and I can also talk about storytelling and how the two of them work together. Women business organization, uh, this uh, women in grocery, a lot of these associations now are saying, hey, can you come in and, and use your skills in terms of uh, talking to our audience, but let's, let's study these podcasts and use the combination of the two. So, and then the final thing is I've had the most incredible partner in RBC because again, their only ask was don't make the story about uh, them, make it about the small business owners, but they can circulate this to hundreds to thousands of people. And, you know, Devinder Gill in BC, I'm going to put on a session with all their branch managers. So the long tail of this content, I'm going at it very differently that uh, I want every entrepreneur in Canada, I want every business school teaching entrepreneurs yeah. to listen to this content, not because it's about me or that I'm going to get paid anymore for it. It's really because I think it, it matters uh, to them, to the individual, and it matters to the, to the Canadian economy. So that's all I'm focused on. I'm really 
uh, growing my podcast. I'm not interested in a Joe Rogan play where I'm going to sell this one day to a, one of the platforms. I want to make it out available to anybody and uh, as commercial free as we make it right now. Yeah. So you, you've seen the trends over the years from, you know, TV to radio to, you know, out of home. Why are podcasts so popular right now? Why do you think it is? You know, I think that the, the stories and, and to me, uh, uh, those that know how to tell the stories have always ruled the world. I mean, we waited in villages for the person that managed to find their way over that mountain to find out what was happening on the other side of the mountain or telling us about this city called Rome with the marble. You know, uh, uh, Chuck Yeager, when he broke the sound barrier and talked about, you know, what it was like, it was a Pocujello. Grandma could sit, be sitting beside me, sipping lemonade. Much later, I realized the barriers were never in the sky in our, in our minds. Well, NASA used that story for years to change culture. And I think what podcast does is instead of trying to tell these stories in snackable 30-second ads or in a piece of a point of sale where you have a second, where you've got to kind of bring everything to life, I think with a good storyteller and podcast, you can really leave the stress of the day. You can get engaged in something. You can be part of somebody else's life. You can get, you can get lessons in life. And that's why I think they're popular. And also I think actually things like uh, earbuds and again, going back to more and more and less that I can, I can listen to content that matters to me. If I love Australian football, I can have a podcast on it. If I'm involved in Formula One, I can have a podcast on it. So the ability to really go an inch wide and a mile deep, I think which makes it special. And that's why people got to stop looking at numbers on podcasts and really focus at passion and engagement and how long, you know, the proudest thing I'm at, I have is that most of my podcasts, it's hundred percent completion. People stay with me through the whole yeah. story. So if I'm holding on to people for 30 minutes, uh, it's because there's something of value for them. And again, I can say it because they're not about me, it's just my ability to stitch together. Like I do on a conference floor, the story between the protagonist and the Yodas that come to the rescue. Incredible. Uh, and for you, Tony, what, what podcasts do you listen to in your uh, free time? You know, it's interesting. I, I love what you're doing. I love what uh, I've listened to a, a number of them, but uh, the daily I love because I'm a, I'm a political historical junkie, not a big fan of Joe Rogan. Just, it's not, he's not my, mm -hmm. uh, his intensity, not uh, Gary V. I mean, some of the big ones I find they're very intense. I really like uh, I love uh, I love when they just take their time a little bit and stretch it out a bit, but I'm also finding that um, because of my own personal insecurities, I'm better at producing my podcast when I haven't listened to ones that I find are exceptional because then I'm overthinking every sentence and every piece of music and I lose some of my authenticity. I mean, people that listen to mine know that I'm an amateur. You know, this isn't, these are, these are, these are from the heart. They're not, I don't have like the 22 people that the daily puts in their credits producing this stuff. So rather than trying to compete with that, I try to just put out, you know, the Tony Chapman that sold lemonade at age five, yeah. uh, uh, you know, hustled radio advertising, putting himself through school and sold, you know, was worried about selling cases of Tide when everybody else was so in the sexy world of producing Tide ads. That's kind of my podcast, a little blue collar. Wow. So Tony, uh, you and I, we both speak at events, we've been at conferences, you've got an agent, uh, and we've been, been at these events. What do you think is the answer and the solution to getting more BIPOC representation at these events that we speak at? Well, there's two things. One, people have got to remove some of their biases and, 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 and what is the, you know, and realize that diversity is an incredibly important part of us learning our curiosity and our ability. So second thing is though, and this is going to, this might challenge a bit of your question. I'm, I'm a belief that all lives matter. Yeah. And I think that I wouldn't want to get a gig for any other reason because I'm the best at delivering it. Hmm. So I would say to the people that are coming up saying, we'll do our part to open people's minds that to listen generously what the message you have to offer, but never get on that stage because you happen to fit uh, 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 a paint by numbers. Get on that stage because you're going to make eyes shine and hearts beat and you're going to get a standing ovation. You're going to tell the stories of where you came from, but more importantly, why did they matter to the audience in context to where they come from? And when you start bringing those two together, that's what the fusion of culture is all about. And I think that's going to be the key. So we'll do our part you do your part and you'll see that it is going to be a poke through jello and the barriers were uh, never in the sky, but all in our collective minds. So who gave you your speak, your first speaking opportunity? I, you know, that's how I, I built my agency because I came out from a, 
when I came out to Toronto from Montreal, I didn't have a network. I didn't go to UCC. I didn't go to Western or Ivy. So I started having to really think about how am I going to stand out? A lot of it was writing, thought leadership. I never talked about the agency. I talked about what I think matters and how, you know, what does it take to engage an audience? And next thing you know, people say, well, I like what you have to say. And I went into the boardrooms and see, so you just come and present to our senior management team. And I started with sort of 10 people. And next thing you know, it was, as you know, it was, it was mod, you know, on a panel or moderating a panel, starting doing keynotes. I remember my first keynote was, I, could, I, mean, I still shiver how bad it was, but you know, you get up there and you put yourself out. And then over time, I realized that this was the perfect channel because if I could uh, talk about the future and talk about uh, how uh, commerce is going to happen in the future and how, why uh, the heart of your brand matters much more than the, than the ingredients of it, then people are going to say, well, I, I love what he has to say. And my agency is not telling me that. Maybe we should bring him in for a brief. And so that's how it started. When I left the agency world, uh, I, you know, I started, I signed up with the National Speakers Bureau. Uh, they were, they couldn't, they were an incredible bureau to present me as a story, you know, talk about storytelling, which was in vogue, not so much on the host side, because that was new, again, a square peg in a round hole. But I just started doing it. And then I just became, you know, I'm a good packager of my content. I started putting it out there and started showing little clips of it. And one thing led to another. And again, I feel for the speakers, especially today, that are doing it because they have to do it because they depend on that income versus the freedom I had that I don't, that I wanted to do it. And I could be really selective at the kind of content and, and, and audiences that I knew, I know I would add real value and relevance to. And when you do that, I think it just the word of mouth travels and send me say, I heard you at the real estate conference and so on and so on. So if you could go back and, and back in time, you know, the DeLorean shows up, you jump in it, you go back in time to when you're five years into running your agency, what advice would you give five years into the agency, Tony? Hire people that are different than you. Understand your strengths and embrace it and hire people that have the strengths and where you're weak. So that's the first thing I would tell myself is I tried to surround myself with too many Tony Chapmans and not enough people that would stand up and oppose me. Yeah. Okay. I'll start, let me start that again, just to make it easier. Yeah. That's a great question. And what the first thing I would do is I talk to Tony Chapman about talent. Don't hire people that are in your own image, hire people that really have strengths and where you're weak. So they can focus on what they do really well and frees you up to focus on what you do really well. And in some cases I did that exceptionally well with people like my first, my first employee was a chartered private accountant. And other times I made some mistakes. Second thing is, is always stay humble. You know, we had a lot of early success and I really started drinking my own Kool-Aid. And it was only when the company I sold to went bankrupt and I had to reinvent myself uh, in, as a, sitting in a the reception desk of an art studio that I realized I'm not the one that's important in this story. It's the people that work for you. It's the clients that depend on you. And I think I would have liked to see more of the humility I think I got later in life in a, in a younger Tony Chapman. And the third thing is uh, um, work-life balance. When I was the first 10 years of my agency, all I did was work. Is when I started my new agency, when I had young daughters that I kept it to under 20 people. So for 10 years, I could walk them to school and be their dad. So I didn't know that in the first five years, I kind of learned that midstream. And, and, uh, and I think that's, you know, it's just, again, life lessons you get along your way. And walking your daughters to school, is it worth it? Oh, the best thing. I tell you, my best friends are my daughters. They're, uh, uh, they're the most lovely. One works for Accenture in London, England. One works for Apple in San Francisco. So I don't see them a lot. But when I, uh, I see them or even talk to them virtually, uh, we have a great relationship. Um, they're the proudest things I've ever done. And uh, at proudest, proudest moments is being just a dad. And uh, I would say to people, invest in your children. If you listen to my podcast, interesting enough, time and time again, the entrepreneur that's succeeding is because I, I used to go to work with my mom or dad. Huh. You know, the one this week is, you know, I, I watched my dad take, do three jobs. I was a latchkey kid. Yeah. Did, did you ever resent it? No, I learned, I learned so many incredible lessons in life. I'm so proud of my dad. So be the, be the parent that says, you know, not everything happens on, on uh, Facebook or, or uh, TikTok. It really happens through uh, personal experiences. It's incredible. And, and all your years of experience working with Pepsi and Dove, et cetera, uh, all the brands that are listening right now who have maybe one, two to five agency relationships, 
What's your advice to brands to have a great agency brand relationship? What would you say to them if you could? We, we've, we've lost trust and we, you know, brands have lost trust with retailers and the whole supply chain has lost trust in each other. So every link is trying to be a fortress. And I think the, the beauty of great relationships, I think in my days with Unilever and Pepsi and Kraft, when we built Kraft Hockeyville, we trusted each other. We cared about each other. We hung out together. You know, we, it, was, it wasn't worried about the shoes going to drop the next day and you're going to uh, lose that account or we're not going to pay you for 160 days, even though you're paying your employees every week. It, we built it on trust and goodwill. And until that comes back, I think it's one of the most toxic environments. I feel so sorry for the people who just love to create, make magic, bring those buyers and sellers together like I used to do on radio, yet they're doing it in a climate which is really about me versus we. Okay. That's great. And and those that are selling radio right now and, and, you know, selling uh, newsprint ads, what's your advice to the the kind of sellers of kind of content pieces or kind of like real estate online or, or, or in radio? You know, the world changed and it's really tough to be in a media that's not about immediate transactions. Yes. So when I'm looking at radio and I'm looking at television, what I would be doing is going to every brand and saying, you need to also show at the top of your funnel empathy. You got to show about how you care about humanity and the planet. You're not going to do that with a mobile ad. You're not going to do that. You're going to do that through long form content like podcasts. You're going to do it through television and radio. And if I was in those mediums, all I would be focusing on is, is uh, showing the heart of the brand and versus am I the best one to sell cars? Because sadly, you're not any longer. You're the best to sell the car brand. You're best to sell why Volvo uh, essence is safety. But in terms of that deal of the week, that's, that's, that world has left you by. Wow. That world has passed you by. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, Tony, uh, favorite apps that you can't live without day to day? I love apps that help me get to where I want to go. I'm a huge fan of Waze because when I'm driving, it, it, uh, it takes away all the stress and, and really improves my odds of getting to places. Yeah. I, I'm a big fan of Booking.com because we love to do spontaneous road trips. So at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we know how far we've gotten. We, want, we know where we got to go. We're often traveling with dogs, so the filters make it really easy. Uh, obviously, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Spotify's of the world that puts millions of songs in my pocket, the Netflix that put content. Anybody that helps me get to where I'm needing to go and gives me more of what matters, less friction. I'm a fan of the, the, the apps that just are there because they feel they've solved a problem I don't have. Sometimes I download them very rarely. I use them and, and more often than not once every couple of months, I delete them. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Tony, it, it's been such a joy and pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, where can people find you? Where can they go to discover your show? The best way to just download Chatter That Matters wherever you get your podcasts or if you want to just go to a website, chatterthatmatters.ca. And brother, I'm a big fan of what you're doing and uh, telling these stories and uh, uh, just celebrating made in Canada creativity. Like this is stop importing this stuff from all over the world that will get you into trouble because it's just mass and crass and get into what's happening in the every pond in Canada, every corner, which is the magic of being Canadian and everything we stand for and make your creative happen around that. And uh, maybe we'll get back to that win-win relationship between the brands and the Canadian consumers they want to do business with. That's awesome. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thanks everyone for joining us this week on Marketing Jam, and we'll see you next week on The Jam.